What does Sherlock Holmes have in common with the FBI? What do Instagram's image filters have in common with detecting blood vessels in the human brain? Now, these things may seem very random, but they're actually really strongly linked together. And that's why I'm here today to talk about how we can link inspiration from many different and seemingly disparate sources to craft novel, innovative, and highly effective solutions to solving some of our community's pressing problems. Hi everyone, my name is Manthet Singh. I'm a senior at Rice University studying computer science, and I'm here today to talk about the concept of open source innovation, or the ability to derive inspiration from many different sources and link them together to craft solutions to some of our biggest problems. So I'd like to share a story with you guys. When I was 16, I had research about colorectal cancer and was baffled at its high mortality rate. How come today with such advances in our healthcare and medicine, was this form of cancer claiming so many lives? I delved further into my research and realized that this particular form of cancer was very deadly just because a lot of people didn't realize they were actually suffering from it till very late stages of the cancer, by which at that time it had become really fatal. To make matters worse, one of the only symptoms of this form of cancer is blood in one's feces, but this blood is often present in microscopic amounts and almost virtually invisible to the human eye. So I had my problem very clearly defined. How do I detect microscopic amounts in, of human blood in one's feces? But I didn't have a solution. I didn't know where to begin. And at that time, I was, I was binge watching Sherlock Holmes on Netflix. And I remember this one scene where Sherlock Holmes asks Dr. Watson, uh, what is the cause of death? And Dr. Watson replies, culpable homicide. And then Sherlock Holmes asks, um, were there any traces of blood? And at that moment, Sherlock Holmes takes this blue solution and sprays it all over the floor. And immediately, the traces of blood out was outlined and you could see uh, glow bright blue. And I shot on my slumber. I was like, that's what I needed. Dr. Watson inspired me to research further into this mysterious blue solution. And I ventured into the FBI's website. I looked at case files, autopsy reports, and a lot of gory pictures, trying to figure out how does the FBI use a similar solution in their crimes and investigations. After hours of browsing through case files, I finally found my answer. C8, H7, and 302 And in other words, luminol. Luminol is a chemical compound that glows in the presence of an oxidizing agent. So what this means is that iron present in your blood would make the compound glow blue. And that's exactly what I needed. So I researched further into how luminol works. I added some more chemical reagents and basically developed a chemical solution in the form of a spray bottle. And, and how it worked was that once the user was done with their bowel movements, they would spray the solution into their toilet bowl. And if it were to um, glow blue, it would indicate the presence of traces of blood in their feces, and they could then seek medical attention as required. And the benefits of the solution was that it was cost-effective, convenient, and very easy to use compared to industry standards. Now, after telling you guys this story, hopefully the link between the FBI, Sherlock Holmes, and cancer detection became more clear. But this begs the question, how do we go about making this link and fusing these two elements together? It may seem like magic, it may seem haphazard, but I'm actually really excited to share a very systematic way that I use to, to link these ideas together. And it's the 3C process. We have concept, combine, and create. So let's start with concept, or the ability to conceptualize a problem. You want to ask, what if? So with concepts and conceptualization, the beauty of it is abstraction. You want to basically be able to take an idea and have multiple layers of abstraction. Uh, what this means is you want to take an idea and you want to strip away all of the extraneous details and things that make it highly specific to your problem until what you're left is, is the crux and a very generic form of the problem. So to give you an example, I was trying to find a solution to the problem, how do I detect microscopic amounts of blood in one's feces? If I abstract away this problem, it boils down to how do I detect microscopic amounts of blood in general? And when I thought about the problem in this way, 
I immediately thought about the FBI and how they were trying to tackle their problem, which was highly similar to mine. And abstraction is beautiful for two things. Firstly, it forces you to think about a problem from many different angles. And secondly, and more importantly, once you have a more generic version of the problem, it opens up your mind to be able to draw inspiration from different sources, in this case, the FBI. We're both trying to tackle the same problem in different situations. And so the concept is, how do we abstract? You want to basically take your problem and figure out what the crux of the problem is. What is the root that makes your problem the problem? And strip away anything else that's extra. And you want to do this till you reach a point where the problem is generic enough that it fits the needs of others and what other people have been doing, but still specific enough to solve your own solution. I usually like to throw this slide in to warn people of the dangers of over-abstraction. Um, while the Lego block is a perfect abstraction of a duck, I believe this is over-abstracting. It's not wrong to say that the Lego block is the perfect abstraction of a duck, but once you've reached that point, the solution becomes ineffective. So now that you have the ability to conceptualize your problem and think more abstractly, I want to talk about the next C, or combine. So how do you combine inspiration from different sources? Where do you look? Where do you start to look? Um, what are you looking for? All of these questions get answered in the combined phase. In the combined phase, if you think about um, this concept of lateral thinking, which was coined by Edward de Bono in 1967, it's basically a way to come up with a solution that cannot be arrived by deductible or logical deductions. What this means in simpler terms is that it's a way to come up with really novel solutions that haven't been done before. If you think about conventional thinking as a tree that grows from the root upwards, think about lateral thinking as a tree that grows its branches outwards. So how do we laterally think? It might seem counterintuitive on the onset, but there's actually two ways to really force your brain to think laterally and opens up uh, a myriad of combinations and, and wild, crazy ideas. So the first way is the random dictionary method. And in this method, what you want to do is, once you have the problem in the back of your head, you want to take a dictionary and open it up to a random page and pick a random word. Then, challenge your brain to link that word you just saw with the problem you're trying to fix. And it will force your brain to come up with wild and imaginative connections. Do this a couple of times, get in the habit of making uh, these seemingly unrelated connections, and it'll kind of force your brain to think about this. The second way is what I call the reverse thinking method. It, in this, you want to ask yourself, what if I got rid of this? What if I got rid of that? You basically want to challenge the status quo and ask, what if I remove this one aspect of the problem? What would happen? To give you a more concrete example of, of this method, which I, is my personal favorite, uh, a couple of years ago, I was developing LifeBand, which is a wearable health monitor for infants, uh, specifically neonatal infants. And this health monitor would track, you know, a blood oxygen level and their breathing, breathing rates and their heart rate. Um, so I looked at what's already been out there. Uh, so some things that came to mind were, you know, the Apple Watches and Fitbits. But there's one big problem. The infant's hand or his, his wrist was too tiny to even house a big uh, wrist bracelet that houses the electronics in it. So I asked myself, what if I got rid of the bracelet? What would happen? And one big problem that jumped to mind is, okay, you got rid of the bracelet. Where do all the sensors and components go? Uh, then I asked, what if I used a glove instead? What if I stitched all of the sensors inside the glove itself such that once the infant slips on their glove, all of the sensor electronics are nicely embedded in there and are still maintaining contact with the skin, but in a very comfortable way for the infant. I basically challenged the status quo and asked, like, what if I got rid of the bracelet that a lot of companies were doing today and did something else? And it worked. Here's a picture of LifeFan with our first user. We, we stitched all of the electronics in a cute sock, and it worked. So you have this concept of uh, lateral thinking, and I taught you guys how to conceptualize your problem. The last C I want to talk about is create. So in, in the creation phase, what happens is you have your source of inspiration, you have 
uh, conceptualize your idea in a more generic form. Now, how do you go about building your idea? So in this creation phase, one interesting point I want to share with you guys is that a lot of the innovations that individuals or companies do are rarely ever new. The beauty is being able to take inspiration from different sources, customizing them, modifying them, and adapting them to fit your own needs. Don't reinvent the wheel. So going back to my original story about um, Instagram image filters and detecting blood vessels in the brain. Here's a little story. So last summer, I was working at a epilepsy research lab in the Texas Medical Center. What this lab basically does is that patients who are suffering from epilepsy would come in. We would implant these long electrodes into their brain and monitor them for a week. And we're trying to determine where in the brain is the epilepsy stemming from. We're trying to localize it. And once we have this information, the neurosurgeon would then cut out that aspect of the brain, which usually leads to a reduction in the number of episodes that the person experiences in their lifetime. Now, the dangerous part about this is how do we implant the electrodes in a way that's safe and in a way that doesn't puncture any major blood vessels or arteries in the brain? That was my challenge. I was basically tasked to finding uh, a way to reconstruct a 3D model of just the blood vessels in a patient's brain from their 2D MRI images. And on the onset, this was a baffling problem. It was a very cool problem, but I didn't know where to start. But when we talk about image processing, we talk about like an image mask. We apply a mask on an image, and what it does, it retains some information about the image and deletes everything else. So I looked online and thought about who are the world leaders in image filters, and two companies came to mind were you know, Snapchat and Instagram. And Instagram had this, what they call a frangy filter, which was really good at detecting cylinders or like tube-like objects, and they use this to detect traffic light poles or stop sign poles. So here's like just a, an image of a, how a frangy filter kind of operates in an image. So you can see a person taking a photograph on the left. And once the frangy filter is applied to the image, all that's left is like long tubular objects. So I had this frangy filter set up. How do I tell the frangy filter to now look for blood vessels? And I thought long and hard about this and I realized that Blood vessels in the brain are like traffic light, like poles or even stop signs. Albeit, they're still cylinders, but really thin and squiggly. So I adapted their image filter and I iterated through it to tweak some of the parameters to start looking for thinner and some, uh, more tube-like objects. And the results were great. Here's a slide showing the original 2D, 2D MRI images on the left and how I applied successive image filters to finally come up with a 3D model of the human brain, where the only thing that's left is those uh, vessels that we're looking for, and it deleted away all of the white matter, gray matter, connective tissues, and muscle fibers. And the experiment was a success. And so what I'm trying to hammer home with this story is that you never want to reinvent the wheel. There's a large community online called the Open Source Innovation Community, and it's a design principle where people develop solutions to the problems they're facing. And once done, they release all of their code and hardware online free for anyone to use. In this case, I leveraged the open source community's uh, Instagram image filter, and I adapted it to fit a highly specific need, in this case, detecting blood vessels in the human brain. The open source in a a community has been great because it allows for rapid developments and innovation and sharing of knowledge. Once I was able to detect blood vessels in the brain, I too released all of my code online so that the next person could benefit in the same way I had benefited off someone else's work. So with that, I wanted to leave you with the three C's again. I want you to think about how you can conceptualize your idea and think about it abstractly. Once done, you want to think about the idea of combining. How do you combine the different sources together through lateral thinking? And lastly, creation. Once you have the source of innovation, how would you modify, adapt, and adopt these different sources of inspiration to create some really cool ideas? I wish you all the best in your entrepreneurial endeavors. Now go forth and change the world. Thank you.